So with that intro, I'd like to bring out Phil Venables, the Chief Information Security Officer for Google Cloud. Phil. Got it. So it's always protocol that you dress the same. So uh, as a Google person, I'm going to stop wearing my tie. But before I take the tie off, Phil, you talk. Uh, at least I don't have a hoodie. Like yeah. That's what we normally <laughs> totally. wear. Totally. Yeah. Uh, the hoodies, you could have talked me uh, into yeah. that one. <laughs> so one of the things, you know, we've got a lot of security practitioners here and folks that will be security practitioners here. You deal with a lot of CISOs. You've been a CISO since the 90s. Uh, for Goldman Sachs before Google Cloud. And by the way, two jobs in how many years? So, well, I think I, yeah, I was CISO at Goldman for 17 years, yeah. which was um, in a, in a, uh, a great customer of Mandiant, but never had to use you for actual incident response, which was great. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> the, um, so when you look at the CISO's challenge today, what are like two or three of the top challenges you're hearing? I went through a few, but I'd love to hear from you as you meet Google Cloud customers. Yeah, no, so I, I, I agree with all the stuff that Kevin went through, but I'd kind of lift it up a level. And I think, you know, what we see across all of our customers and across the industry overall is really three challenges. One, it's the thing that, yeah, I think you're all dealing with, which is the challenge of how do you manage security, information, and cyber risk in a hybrid on-premise, environment in a combination of multiple clouds, large numbers of SaaS services. How do you think about identity and access, configuration and posture management? How do you think about consuming sensory telemetry from all of that? How does it all hang together? And then how do you think about the supply chain risks underpinning all of that? Managing that, pretty much every you know, even a small enterprise, never mind a large major uh, corporation, has to deal with that hybrid multi-cloud, multi-SaaS environment. The second piece, I think, which is you know, in partnership with your technology and business teams, is how quickly can you modernize your technology environment? Most organizations are sitting on technology from the past two decades that wasn't designed with today's security threats in mind. And a big challenge for everybody is to modernize the technology platform onto a more defendable platform where security is built in, not bolted on after the fact. And getting to that modern platform as quickly as possible Ideally, we'd like that to be in the cloud, but it could be on-premise, cloud-like environments with environments designed uh, with that in mind. And I think the third and final thing, and this is kind of resonant of a lot of the stuff you talked about in the, in the first presentation, is speed and agility. Um, and this is not just how the security team supports the speed and agility of your business or your organization's mission, but also the speed and agility of your own operations. Your ability to get that OODA loop, that observe, orient, decide, act loop, going faster and faster, and especially faster than the attackers, and getting 10xing your operations, 10xing your cyber workforce productivity, 10xing your telemetry, 10xing your responsiveness to new threats, dealing with them both tactically and strategically. That speed and agility, how you outpace the attackers and stay ahead is exactly where you're going to need to focus. And, and again, this is where I think the combination of Google and Mandiant is really going to help on that, uh, especially delivering in that multi-cloud, multi-SaaS, and on-premise environment across all of the vendors and all of the clouds, not just Google Cloud. Right. Well, Phil, thank you for summarizing what I tried to say. That was excellent. <laughs> the, uh, and you get to talk to a lot of boards as well, and I've kind of heard you do that before. What is your messaging when you speak to corporate boards? I mean, I think it's interesting, and you, again, you touched on this a little bit. Yeah. The, the way we kind of encourage boards to think about this, there's a little bit of fear in the boardrooms that cyber is this kind of, this dark, mysterious art that, that is really difficult to manage. And, and, and the way I kind of think about this is when you think about what a board needs to do, it's to think about what is the most critical assets and services an organization has. What are the risks that are facing those assets and services? What controls mitigate those risks? And are those controls being monitored as being continuously effective? 
And then what residual risks remain and who at what level in the organization has deemed those residual risks acceptable? And what's the end-to-end -end process to constantly validate that you're staying on top of the risks, identifying the right risks? Now, in that whole paragraph, I never used the word technology. I didn't use cyber. I didn't use information security. That's just the general approach that boards have to manage a whole array of risks, not just operational risks, but business risks, financial risks, strategic risks. And the more boards can get used to that, and especially the more the security teams can answer that question in a coherent way. And I think if a lot of organizations are honest, today they're not doing a great job of answering that question, and the boards are not doing a great job of holding the security and technology and risk teams accountable for answering that question. I think the other thing as well, and again, you touched on this a little bit, which is to essentially expect more of the boards in understanding these risks. There's a little bit of a tone in the industry that I think we should push back on that we need to somehow dumb down communications to the board. And that is actually doing boards a disservice. Most boards in most industries have tremendous depth of expertise, whether it's um, doctors and practitioners on healthcare boards, whether it's specialists in financial risk on bank boards, the list could go on. There's no reason why today's modern digital businesses shouldn't have a plethora of not just cyber experts, but digital business and technology experts on the board to be able to provide the oversight. The final example I'll give is, is another one. When you think about boards should have a higher expectation of not just security leadership, but technology leadership. So a board, for example, should be asking a CIO or a CTO, do you have all of your software under control? Is it in one controllable place? Is it continuously integrated and deployed and tested? Is it under consistent management? Do you understand the software supply chain dependencies of your entire digital asset base? Now, the pushback I get when I say that is, well, you know, people go, well, Phil, that's, that's, just, that's a bit in the weeds, isn't it? They, you know, for boards to be expected to do that. And you go, well, hang on a minute. Imagine if you were talking about accounting and the board asked the CFO, the chief financial officer, Where's, you know, do we have all the accounts under control? Is the ledger in one place? Is the cash flow reconciled every day? Do we understand our entire financial position? And if the CFO went, well, that's a little bit difficult. I'm not entirely sure. We've got lots of different places where all the finances are. You know, the CFO would be replaced almost immediately. And there's no reason why when the most critical asset in many respects to most businesses is their digital assets, their software that runs their business that we shouldn't have higher expectations on how we manage software. Now, again, I won't do a pitch, but clearly uh, the cloud providers, especially Google Cloud, can do a lot to help on that. But, you know, that's, uh, that's a story for another day. Well, you're in charge of securing <laughs> Google Cloud. So could you share with everybody, you know, so what are you doing in 2023? Any special endeavors coming up? Well, we, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Again, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of just give a, give a summary in a few minutes, but the, the way we kind of think about this, and we announced this last year that we, we were investing another $10 billion on security over the next few years because we think it's that important to bake security into the platform and into the infrastructure. And it's not just Google Cloud. We're spending a lot of money in the open source community. Uh, a lot of you have seen the investments we've been making in and around the Open Source Security Foundation. Some of the stuff we're doing op on open source and open standards to promulgate security, not just on Google Cloud, but across the industry in, in general. So we're very, very focused on that. The other thing that we're focused on, again, is investing in foundational security measures in the platform to get ahead of whole classes of attacks. We've invested a lot in security and in authentication technology. We're investing a lot in operating system security, in hypervisor security. We're investing a lot in software supply chain measures. And all of this is making its way into the products we provide to everybody. The other thing I would say, though, is there's probably two main focus areas. And the you know, first one is shifting from what everybody knows as shared responsibility responsibility in the cloud to what we call shared fate, which is us reaching across that line of shared responsibility and really partnering with customers on secure defaults, secure blueprints, all the way through to our partnerships with the insurance industry on making sure you're able to get effective and reasonably priced cybersecurity insurance for running on an effective cloud and running with an effective configuration. So that shared fate mission is something about how we partner with customers because we recognize it's important not just to have 
defense in depth from attacks, but also defense in depth from configuration errors and all the other things that can go wrong in the cloud if we don't partner effectively. The final thing I would say is we're very focused on, and this is really resonant of why we think the partnership with Mandiant is so important, is we're all about building a digital immune system. And if you think about cloud now, especially hyperscale cloud, we push out hundreds of updates every month. It's new security features, security updates in the platform, a lot of which has been informed by threat intelligence, vulnerability research, bug bounty programs, as well as the input from many of our customers who want extra security features. And the fact that we can take that into the platform and propel it out to everybody, it's like a rising tide lifting all boats. And the fantastic thing about the coupling of Mandiant with our existing threat capability gives us an even bigger aperture into the world of attacks that we can think about how do we innovate and invest in the platform to mitigate whole classes of attacks, to drive things forward, to just really make life difficult for the attacker and drive that OODA loop by providing more features in the platform. And I think that, that coupling is going to be very effective. OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, act. That's Man. Air Force. There Pilot. you go. The, um, so I don't see it because I've known you and you're smiling right now, but you said it so it has to be true. You're a short-term pessimist when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. Why a short-term pessimist? By the way, that means there's optimism somewhere. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. So I'm, I'm yeah. short-term pessimist, long-term optimist. Got it. And so I think short-term pessimist because, look, I think it would be to deny the truth that the world, you know, doesn't face, you know, we face clear challenges today. Most organizations are running on technology that needs to be modernized. There are many, many issues every day. Uh, but when you think about what's coming and what has happened in many organizations, many organizations today are highly effective against defending against a lot of attacks. Uh, you said this earlier, the fact that attackers are having to work harder and come up with more advanced attacks, use more zero days, is a sign of success because it means we're turning the corner on our ability to defend against most of the routine attacks. And our goal is to make attackers work harder and harder. So, a little bit pessimistic because I think most organizations have still got a lot of unwinding of legacy and moving to more modern platforms where security is built in, not bolted on. But when you think about where we're going and the investments that most organizations have made and the transformation in the work between the security teams and the technology teams in most major enterprises to start modernizing their technology, to move on to that more defendable architecture, to solve many of these issues. The fact that we're in rooms like this with the partnerships between organizations and sectors, the partnership between the public and private sectors growing, we're starting to turn the corner. So I'm very, very optimistic for the future. We're clearly, as you all know, going to keep facing attacks and threats. That's just going to be a fact of life. But I think we're never, you know, I don't think we've ever been more best positioned for the future going forward than we are now. But I think it's still going to take another couple of years to kind of work out some of the, uh, some of the issues everybody have got today before we kind of realize that more optimistic future. But yeah, short-term pessimist, long-term optimist. Is long-term two years? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. The, uh, well, so, for, well for, some, you yeah. know, for some organizations today, it's, 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 it's today. today. Uh, I mean, again, I think you know, some of you will see this in some of the new environments you've built that are taking advantage of a modern technology platform. You, you've got the ability to, you know, an environment that is a, a runtime environment when you're only running signed authentic software, where you're monitoring everything, where you've segmented it. It's the, the, the capabilities there today, and many organizations are running that way. The sad thing is, many Many organizations have got kind of a mixed environment where they still have uh, the attackers exploiting the seams between the legacy and the new. But I think there's, you know, as the, you know, as the, the old William Gibson quote, quote the, the futures are you know, already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So the goodness is already here, but there's a long yeah. way for many organizations to go to get to that. Well, in the last minute and 30 seconds, Phil, um, let's go with this question. What would you tell all the folks out there that are aspiring to become cybersecurity professionals, but they're in school today uh, and just about to come out? How would you prepare them? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, not just fixate on going straight down the cybersecurity career path. I think there's more options than ever before to get 
some basic cyber qualifications. So there's, there's a bunch of stuff that we're working on around training and certificates for K through 12 plus universities. Um, so I think there's, there's more opportunity for people to gain the cyber. But I think for a, probably a lot of you in this audience, some of your best training ground for being a cyber security professional was doing other things in IT, whether it was kind of help desk, software development, operations, other types of platform engineering. And I think you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the best cybersecurity people I've seen are people that have been through those multiple disciplines. So for kind of aspiring professionals, I would say, don't just fixate on starting in cyber and always being in cyber. Kind of rotations in and out and through different technology disciplines is useful. I think also rotating in and out of business units into different business and risk positions always gives you a, a different perspective. I like to think that, and again, a, a combination of roles and, and, uh, and functions in cybersecurity teams is important. It's important to have that technical depth and the understanding of the threat. It's also important, as you all know, because you probably all do this as a large part of your job is translating technical risk into business risk in the terms that the businesses can understand so that they can continue to invest and prioritize in this. The great thing now about cybersecurity, it's a very, very big field and scope for all sorts of different disciplines within that, from the threat, the technical work, all the way through to business risk and, uh, and many other things beyond as well. Well, Phil, thank you so much for joining us. And yep. to all of you, thank you for joining us for the next few days. We have the opportunity, Mandy and Google Cloud, all of us working together to forever change our industry. Let's learn something over the next few days that puts us on the path to get there faster. Thank you very much.